Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Today I am going to talk about another rectal disease problem, proctitis, and then also the benign rectal tumors. The objective of this lecture is that at the end of this lecture, all the students should be able to know what is proctitis, what are the different types of proctitis, and their treatment, and then. What are the different benign tumors, benign tumors of the rectum? So we will start with the proctitis. What is proctitis? By definition, proctitis is inflammation of the rectum. This is often associated. This uh, proctitis is often associated with inflammation of colon. That means proctocolitis. So, along with the inflammation of the rectum, other parts of the large gut, colon, they are also involved, and sometimes the term proctocolitis is also used. Now, there are different types of proctitis. We can say it may be a acute proctitis, chronic proctitis, non-specific proctitis. So, this is one way to group proctitis into acute and chronic forms as far as the etiology of the proctitis is concerned etiology is unknown the concept that the con condition is a mild and limited form of ulcerative colitis is the most acceptable hypothesis this is the most uh, high, acceptable hypothesis that this is the mild or uh, limited form of ulcerative colitis. Although in this case, actual ulceration is often not present. Now, the clinical features. The patient is usually is a middle-aged and he complains of, uh, he's a middle-aged patient and the complaint is usually passage of slight blood in the stool. He also complains of defecatory frequency. Often the complaint is diarrhea but it reveals relatively normal action of bowels with some blood slight blood in the slight blood and then mucus and then in sewer forms there may be pus also in the stools these patients they also complain of tenismus it's a painful defecation basically with the inadequate the patient says that he want to pass but there is urge and he cannot pass this is tenismus basically so there is tenismus in these cases along with the passage of flatus and little blood stained fecal matter. Also acute proctitis is usually accompanied by malaise and pyrexia. That means acute proctitis is usually associated with constitutional upset also. Complaining of myalgias and pyrexia. Now, how we diagnose proctitis? Proctitis, after history, then if you go on to the examination, in that part, it is the digital rectal examination. On that, this examination, mucosa feels swollen and is often, there is pain when we are palpating digitally the rectum. Then other methods to diagnose the proctitis, we have to do proctoscopy, we have to do sigmoidoscopy. There, there are more valuable method of examination and show inflamed mucosa of the rectum. Clonoscopy is also required in these cases. Now, if the diagnosis is confirmed, clonoscopy with multiple biopsies is mandatory to determine the extent of the inflammatory process. So once once the diagnosis of proctitis is there that the rectum is involved, it is inflamed. So it is essential 
that we should do colonoscopy and we should do multiple biopsies it is mandatory so the idea behind is we want to know the extent of the inflammatory process as i told you usually rectum proctitis is also associated with inflammation of the rest of the colon also so that is the reason why we have to do colonoscopy in these patients other assessment in these patients to establish or exclude the diagnosis of specific infection we have to do a bacteriological examination we can also do culture of the stool examination of the scrapings or swabs from ulcers and then we can also do serological tests for the diagnosis in these cases as far as the treatment is concerned in many patients proctitis is a self limiting disease but topical use of five amino salicylic acid in the form of acetol pentosa it is used in in the form of suppositories or it in the form of foam for topical use topical steroids they are also used but they are less effective alternatives in very severe form resistant cases oral steroids are used for remission Similarly, we can also use oral 5 amino salicylic acid in the form of acetol and pentosa, and oral preparations they are also available and they are used for the treatment of proctitis. As far as the surgical option in these cases is that is rarely required. Usually, these cases they are treated medically. Now, the next step are what are the different types of Uh, proctitis we can group proctitis into non specific proctitis and we can group proctitis into specific types of proctitis so as far as the non specific proctitis is concerned this is one form so infl- this is inflammatory condition affecting the mucosa and to a lesser extent the sub mucosa and this is confined to the distal rectum this is no non specific proctitis in about 10% of the cases the condition extends to involve the whole colon total ulceration involvement of the colon proctocolitis that is of non specific variety now if we talk about the specific types of uh, uh, proctitis proctitis as we know it can be a part of ulcerative colitis proctitis is present in most cases of the ulcerative colitis and the degree of rectal involvement may influence the type of operative procedure so one specific form of proctitis is that it is part of the ulcerative colitis about 90% of the cases of ulcerative colitis rectum is involved this this is part is involved in ulcerative colitis and our diagnosis or biopsy may be confined to the rectum in cases of ulcerative colitis then proctitis may be part of the crohn's disease crohn disease can occasionally affect the rectum although classically it is spared classically it is spared means usually it is not involved in crohn's disease semidoscopic appearances differ from those in non specific proctitis the inflammatory process tends to be patchy rather than confluent and there may be fissuring ulceration or even a cobblestone appearance which is typical of crohn's disease rectal crohn disease is often associated with severe perineal disease characterized by fistulation we many a times we have talked about the fistula in ano and then we talked that fistula may be primary it can be secondary so the secondary fistula in ano one of the causes is crohn's disease 
So, rectal Crohn disease is often associated with severe perineal disease, perineal disease which is characterized by fistulation, fissuring and hemorrhoids. These are always, these conditions uh, are secondary, secondary variety in Crohn of causes, underlying causes Crohn disease. So, coexisting disease is often present in the rest of the colon or small bowel or both. So, which is typical of Crohn disease and as it, even in rectum it is the skip lane, it's not the whole bowel which is involved. Another variety, radiation speci specific types is radiation proctitis. Radiation therapy is used in the treatment of cervical, prostate and rectal cancer. It can produce acute radiation proctitis with bleeding, pain, diarrhea and defecatory frequency. Most symptoms settle within a few weeks but some patients develop chronic proctitis with symptoms appearing months or even decades after the radiation exposure. So keep in this mind, radiation proctitis can be acute radiation proctitis and it can be a chronic radiation proctitis. Then there is another group of proctitis due to specific infections. These are infectious type infections which can also cause uh, proctitis. So there are specific organisms causing uh, proctitis. One is Clostridium difficile. This is an acute form of proctocolitis caused by infection with Clostridium difficile can, which can follow after the use of broad spectrum antibiotics. And the notorious one is one is clindamycin, which can also lead to a membranous type of pseudocolitis. So a pseudomembrane is formed in these patients and then this is due to Clostridium difficile. A membrane can sometimes be seen on sigmoidoscopy and this is pseudomembranous colitis and I, I told you that one notorious for this is the antiviral clindamycin which leads to pseudomembranous colitis. This you should keep in mind. Another specific infection and proctitis is amoebic dysentery. Amoebic dysentery the infection is more likely to be chronic with exacerbation after a long period of symptom improvement. Proctoscopy and sigmoidoscopy are not painful in these patients. So amoebic dysentery, this is another very common type of proctitis prevalent in our society. It is in the form of acute mebic dysentery. It is also in the form of chronic mebic dysentery. Procto and sigmoidoscopy are helpful, but they are not fruitful. We can easily perform in these patients. Scrapings from the ulcers should be sent to laboratory for immediate microscopic examination. Acute mebic dysentery, in that case, scraping we see under the microscope vegetative form of the amoeba can be seen. Chronicity, chronicity is marked by spores which are there under when we examine under microscope. Amoebic granuloma. Amoebic dysentery can lead to amoebic granuloma. What is amoebic granuloma? Which is due to amoebiasis. It's a soft mass usually in the rectosigmoid region. Frequently it is mistaken for a carcinoma. That's why I right down here amoebic granuloma this is one differential diagnosis for carcinoma because it presents as a mass sigmoidoscopy shows ulcerated surface in these patients but the mass is less friable than a carcinoma a scraping should be taken in these patients 
and the material sent for immediate microscopic examination. Their vegetative form amoeba as well as spores can be seen, especially the vegetative form which is present in the acute form. A biopsy can also be helpful in these patients of amoebic granuloma. Amoebic granuloma of the rectum is encountered in patients who visited a country in which the disease is endemic. So tropical countries, here even on our patient, it's not a very common presentation, but amoebiasis is there in our setup also. Another specific infection of the rectum, tuberculous proctitis. Nearly always this is associated with active pulmonary tuberculosis or tuberculous ulceration of the anus. So tuberculous proctitis, it is always associated with active pulmonary tuberculosis. Some mucous rectal abscesses burst initially, so some mucus in tuberculosis of the rectum, some mucus abscesses they form, they burst and then they leave form ulcers and what is specific about these ulcers, they are having undermined marge, edge. It is a feature of the tuberculous ulcer anywhere but we are talking here in the rectum. A hypertrophic type of tuberculous proctitis occurs in association with tuberculous peritonitis. A tuber tuberculous proctitis in, occurs in association with tuberculous peritonitis or tuberculous serpengitis. So keep in mind these conditions, these associations with uh, tuberculous peritonitis. Tuberculous proctitis diagnosis requires biopsy. So it is the biopsy which confirms the diagnosis and obviously then the treatment once the diagnosis is there, the treatment is anti-tuberculous chemotherapy. Another specific infective proctitis is gonococcal proctitis. It occurs in both sexes as a, and as a result of rectal coitus or in female from direct spread from the vulva. In acute stage the mucous membrane is hyperemic and thick pus is withdrawn on proctoscopy. In early stages the diagnosis established by bacteriological examination but later on more it becomes more difficult to recognize. So early in early stages it is easy to diagnose by a bacteriological examination but later on the diagnosis becomes difficult and because it becomes difficult to recognize. Gonococcal proctitis is treated by systemic treatment that means with IV antibiotics and the gonococcal proctitis responds to these systemic treatment by antibiotics. Another specific type of proctitis lymphogranuloma venerum. The modes of Infection are similar to those of gonococcal proctitis, a sexually transmitted disease, lymphogranuloma venerum. But in the female, chlamydial infection spreading from the cervix uteri via lymphatics to the pararectal lymph node is common. So, in these uh, cases, lymphogranuloma venerum causing proctitis, there may be associated lymph nodes in the pararectal area. Proctoscopic findings are the same as in gonococcal proctitis. So the inflammation along with pus is there when the proctoscope is withdrawn. The diagnosis should be suspected when the inguinal lymph nodes are greater, greatly enlarged although the enlargement may be subsiding by the time proctitis commences. So another point for diagnosis here is that inguinal lymph nodes, they are also enlarged in these cases. So lymphogranuloma venerum, proctitis, keep in mind 
may be associated with inguinal lymph nodes, they are also involved and enlarged. So they may be palpable and this may be helpful in the diagnosis. HIV infection, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, it is also may be associated with proctitis. Patient may present with a particularly fluorotype of proctitis. These patients, they present with fluorotype of proctitis. These are patients of HIV infection. In such patients, unusual organisms such as cytomegalovirus, CMB, herpes simplex virus and organisms such as cryptosporidium are often found and they are the cause of proctitis in HIV infection. Another, uh, another uh, condition of the rectum like proctitis, strawberry lesion of the rectosigmoid. This is caused by Sparochyta vincenti and the Bacillus fusiformis leading to the strawberry lesion of the rectosigmoid, another procto proctitis. The leading symptom is diarrhea in these cases, often scanty bloods which are scantily blood stained. So, symptom is diarrhea, maybe there is a blood staining of the stools. Stool examination shows presence of specific organism in these patients, which is Pyrochyta vincitani and Bacillus fusiformis. Sigmoidoscopy in these patients shows thick lesion with raised mucosa and superficial ulceration in the rectosigmoid with blood oozes at numerous pinpoints giving the appearance of an overripe strawberry. That's why we call this condition as a strawberry lesion of the rectosigmine. A swab should be taken for vincentize and fusiform organism and bacteriological this organism they can be seen for diagnosis. Swabs from the gums and the throat are also advisable in these patients. So, so this is strawberry lesion of the rectosigmoid. Another condition, rectal bilharziasis, which is caused by cystosoma mensunai. It is endemic. This condition is endemic in many tropical and subtropical countries and particularly in the delta of the Nile, Egypt. This is the area where this rectal bilharziasis is prevalent. So this presents in stages. The stage in the first stage, initial part of the disease, a cutaneous lien develops at the site where the this stematode and enters the and per this parasite because this parasite of this is of fresh water is it is a from this is this uh, cystosomia is mensonai is a parasite of fresh water snails so cutaneous lesions develop at the site of entrance of the cercaria so initially in the stage 1, a cutaneous lien develops. In the stage 2, which is characterized by pyrexia, urticaria and a high eosinophilia, both these stages are frequently overlooked. So it is the third stage which results from the deposition of the ova in the rectum and it is manifested by bilharzial dysentery. So this is rectal bilharziasis caused by the cystosoma mensunai. In this, this condition of proctitis, papillomas, which may be sessile and are pedunculated, or they contain the ova of the this trem trematoid, trematoda which is cystosoma mensunai. Condition, if it is untreated, the rectum becomes festooned 
and the prolapse of the diseased mucous membrane is also present. Multiple fistulae in ANO are prone to develop in this condition. Again, the primary treatment in this condition is also systemic. IV antibiotics. When the papillomas persist in spite of general treatment, they should be treated by local destruction. So they should be managed locally. Another variety, proctitis due to herbal anemas. This is another condition when herbal anemas they are used to treat constipation that can result in proctitis. Again, this is this is uh, clin this clinical entity is present in tropical countries, especially the Africa, where these enemas they are used. Following an enema consisting of a concoction of ginger, pepper, and bark, administered by a witch doctor, a virulent proctitis occurs. Pelvic peritonitis sometimes supervenes in these patients. So these are again treated with bed rest, large doses of morphine and antibiotics and suppositories of 5-SA amino salicylic acid with stool soft, soft soup. Temporary colostomy is sometimes done in these patients resulting proctitis due to herbal anemia. So this was all about the, uh, uh, the proctitis, its types, non-specific and specific, then the specific infection leading proctitis we have talked about and their treatment. Now we come to the benign rectal tumors. The benign rectal tumors the rectum along with the sigmoid colon is the most frequent site of polyps. And also the cancer in the gastrointestinal tract. So this is the very common uh, with, with along with the sigmoid. This is the most frequent site of polyps, rectum and sigmoid colon. Adenomatous polyps of the colon and rectum have the potential to become malignant. Again, keep in mind, adenomatous this is, a, is something which I have to be highlighted. Adenomatous polyps of the colon and rectum have the potential to become malignant. Now, the chance of developing invasive cancer in these patients is enhanced if the polyp is more than one centimeter in size. So that is the size of these adenomalous polypi. It is more than one centimeter. The chance of developing invasive character is more. So the size is important in these cases. Removal of all the polyps is recommended to allow complete histological diagnosis and exclude carcinoma. This is best done using endoscopic biopsy or snare polypectomy techniques. If, if one or more rectal polyps are discovered on sigmoidoscopic examination, a clonoscopy must be performed. This is another important point. You should you should keep in mind so then we come the rectum shares the same spectrum of polyps as the colon polyps are described in terms of their appearance pedunculated whether they are pedunculated whether they are sessile whether they are flat or the histological composition whether they are tubular villus tubular villus so if we now talk about the polyps which are relevant to the rectum there are a number of polyps and they are they are again their spectrum uh, they describe in terms of their appearance or histological variety in terms of appearance means whether they are have a pedicle 
whether they are sessile or maybe these polyps, they are flat. Histological composition divides them into tubular variety, then villous variety and tubular villous. The tubular adenomas or mixed tubular villous adenomas are the most common type of polyp in the rectum. Keep in mind, again I repeat, tubular adenomas are more mixed tubular villous adenomas are the most common type of the polyp of the rectum. They have the potential to turn malignant, particularly if the size is over one centimeter. If we talk about the villous adenomas, they have a characteristic a characteristic frond like appearance they may be very large occupying much of the circumference of the rectum these tumors have an increased tendency to become malignant as compared to the tubular or tubular villus villus adenomas they are more prone to become malignant rarely these villus adenoma they produce profuse mucus discharge from the these tumors which is rich in potassium and causes electrolyte and fluid losses hypokalemia leads these villous adenomas they can cause hypokalemia this is one point which you should keep in mind if there is a, a, on digital examination, uh, there is a hard area in these adenomas, and the, the, then chances are there that maybe it is, they are malignant and they must be biopsied in those cases. Treatment of these villous adenomas provided cancerous change has been excluded. These tumors can be removed by submucosal resection endoscopically, surgically, per, again through the anum, per anum, by sleeve resection from above. Transanal endoscopic microsurgery is another technique to deal with these, uh, these uh, adenomas. Ra rarely, rarely, the option of rectal excision is there in these cases. Then familial, uh, the rectal adenomas, they may be part of familial adenomatous polyposis, which is an autosomal dominantly inherited condition, which is characterized by multiple rectal and clonic adenomas around puberty. It is due to mutation of the adenomatous polyposis coli APC gene, as you know, Genetic testing in the 75% of the families in which a mutation can identify it. A clonoscopy and biopsy will confirm the diagnosis. This is a very specific condition, familial adenomatous polyposis and rectum is involved in this case. So one of the polyps of the rectum, they may be part of the familial adenomatous polyposis. So treatment in these cases, again, total adenomatous polyposis coli, total colectomy must be performed, but regular flexible endoscopy, removal of the polyps before they develop carcinoma. So if you do total colectomy and leave the rectum behind, you have to repeat flexible endoscopic examination and keep an eye on the uh, rectum in these cases. Restorative proctocolectomy with allial pouches, allial pouch, anal anastomosis, another option in which proctocolectomy is done. And it is restorative, obviously, when we do a allial pouch and anal anastomosis. A pan proctocolectomy, another option, a pan proctocolectomy with permanent ileostomy, especially when patient follow up may be impractical. So, another option in cases of adenomatous polyposis coli is pan proctocolectomy and then permanent ileostomy. 
So these are the option of treatment in cases of adenomatous polyposis coli. So the other polyps relevant to the rectum is hyperplastic polyp. These are small pinkish sessile polyps about 2 to 4 millimeter in diameter and they are frequently multiple. They are common and generally harmless. Keep in mind, I am talking about hyperplastic polyps. They are small pinkish sessile polyps, size is about 2 to 4 millimeter in diameter. They are multiple and they are common and generally harmless. Keep in mind about the hyperplastic polyps. Inflammatory pseudopolyps. Inflammatory pseudopolyps, they are, these are basically edematous islands of mucosa. They are usually associated with colitis, but most inflammatory diseases, including tropical disease, can cause these inflammatory pseudopolyps. Even in ulcerative colitis, pseudopolyps, they are formed. They are more likely to cause radiological, dif uh, when we, uh, radiological difficulty as the sigmoidoscopic appearance is usually associated with obvious signs of active or quiescent inflammation. So, while talking about the inflammatory pseudopolyps, keep in mind they are inflammatory and one example of this ulcerative colitis. Sigmoidoscopy in these cases will show obvious signs of inflammatory cause. So, this is inflammatory pseudopolyps present in the rectum. Another variety of the rectal polyp is juvenile polyp. This is a bright red glistening pedunculated sphere which is called cherry tumor which is found in infants and children. Occasionally it persists into adult life. It can cause bleeding or pain if it prolapses during defecation. It often separates itself sometimes but can be removed easily with forceps or snare. A solitary juvenile polyp has virtually no tendency to become malignant but should be treated if it is causing symptom. It has a unique histological structure with large mucus filled spaces covered by a smooth surface of thin rectal cuboidal epithelium. Again I repeat, if somebody asks you what is the commonest cause of bleeding per rectum in infants and children, your answer should be juvenile polyp. So it's another variety of rectal polyp. It can be present in the rectum, it may be out there in the sigmoid and more proximally. So the presentation of juvenile polyp, hematomatous polyp, also called bleeding per rectum or pain when it prolapses. This is again rarely autosomal dominantly inherited syndrome juvenile polyposis does confer an increased risk of gastrointestinal cancers. This is a specific type of a condition, autosomal dominantly inherited juvenile polyposis, which is characterized by multiple juvenile polyps and a positive family history. Though point, two points, multiple juvenile polyps and a positive family history. This is case of autosomally dominantly inherited syndrome, juvenile polyposis. So, if we so now summarize the polyps in the rectum, they are either single or multiple. They may adenoma are the, are the most frequent histological type. 
villus adenomas may be extensive and undergo malignant chain more commonly than the tubular variety all adenomas must be removed to avoid carcinomatous change and because adenoma to carcinoma chain is a, a definite definite pattern for invasive uh, and cancers of the rectum all patient must undergo endoscopy to and determine whether further polyps are present more proximally most polyps can be removed by endoscopic technique but sometimes major surgery is required in these patients now there are two more conditions we are going to talk about is endometrioma another benign tumor of the rectum endometrioma is a rare and may be misdiagnosed as carcinoma it's a part of endometriosis in the female it produces either a constricting lesion of the recto sigmoid or a tumor invading the rectum from the recto vaginal septum the later variety give rise to a very tender submucous elevation of the rectal wall that is the recto vaginal from when it arises from the uh, invading from the recto vaginal septum endometrioma occurs usually between 20 and 40 years of age in case of female dysmenorrhea and the rectal bleeding particularly which is coinciding with the menses menstrual cycle are the main symptoms of endometrioma sigmoidoscopy in these patient shows a stricture at the recto sigmoid junction with the mucus mem uh, membrane which is intact and then also the history which is very important in this patient treatment is hormonal it is hormonal therapy which is the first line of therapy total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingoforectomy and even bowel resection may be required in these patients another benign tumor of the rectum we are going to talk about is the hemangioma hemangioma of the rectum which is uncommon cause of serious bleeding hemorrhage from the rectum men localized in the lower part of the rectum or anal canal a hemangioma can be excised easily when the lesion is diffuse or it is lying in the upper part of the rectum the symptoms simulate ulcerative colitis and the diagnosis becomes often missed for a long period or it is mistakenly thought to be a carcinoma when hemangioma is proximal in the proximal part of the rectum so what is the treatment selective angiography and embolization which is required which also diagnoses gives support for diagnosis and the treatment axion of the rectum is rarely required in these patients so this is hemangioma of the rectum presenting with the bleeding and one condition we have to uh, accept from the give suspicion of malignancy gastro gist again gastrointestinal stromal tumor they are less maybe smooth muscle tumors of the rectum which are rare if the mitotic Uh, rate is high on histological examination and if there is variation in nuclear membrane size and shape hyperchromasia and frequent bizarre cells these tumors are likely to metastasize so this is basically gist tumors of the rectum we are talking about gist retreatment should whenever possible by the radical excision so this is another tumor of the rectum gastrointestinal stromal tumor gist tumor so this is all about the benign tumors of the rectum if you have any questions you can ask me on the your whatsapp group i'll respond on that group thank you